Hello, in this video we're going to talk about Lewis formulas, or better known as Lewis structures. Lewis structures are the primary way that chemists use to describe and draw molecules, which is a big thing that we do, and so we need to learn how to do that. In this video we'll talk about the basics of drawing Lewis structures, and then later we'll talk about resonance and exceptions to the octet rule and other good stuff. Okay, so Lewis was the first to suggest that the covalent bond involves sharing of electrons. And this is the valence electrons at work because they're the ones closest to the exterior of the atom, and so they can interact with other atoms nearby. The core electrons don't interact with the other electrons nearby. So why would atoms want to share electrons? Well, if you look at two fluorine atoms, and here's the Lewis dot symbols for fluorine atoms with seven valence electrons, well, if they were to share electrons, then, well, each individual fluorine atom has seven electrons, but if they share these two electrons, then they can each have eight electrons. Now, eight electrons is the noble gas configuration, and that's very stable. So by sharing these electrons, they get something out of it. They get this stable electron configuration for both atoms. And so atoms will typically form what's known as an octet, which means they have eight electrons assigned to them in the Lewis structure, including both shared electrons. And sometimes we call this, actually often we call this the octet rule. The octet rule, like all good rules, can be broken, but we'll start with the rule and then we'll figure out how to break it later. Now for hydrogen and helium, they only want a duet because hydrogen and helium are just filling the 1s orbital, whereas anything in the second row of the periodic table is going to try to fill the entire n equals 2 shell, which has the 2s and the 2p orbital in it. So that makes 8 electrons. Okay, so here's our Lewis structure of fluorine. So this is called a covalent bond, because the valence electrons are being shared, covalent, and will then leave the other electrons around because they have a physical importance as well, and so we call these lone pairs. So when you're determining octets, does this, uh, does this atom have an octet, you need to count all the electrons in any bonds to that atom and in lone pairs to that atom. Now what we typically do is we take these two electrons in the single covalent bond and we draw them as a line. So these, oh, the, ah, those electrons there, we're going to draw them as a line. You get the point. And this is what you see quite often. You see letters that represent elements and lines in between them. Now, let me talk about how this relates to our content from chapter 6. So when we were talking about an ionic bond, the electrostatic force generated after the electron was swapped, that force holds together ions. And so we've expressed this with Lewis dot symbols, right? If you look at magnesium, each one of these electrons goes to one of the chlorine atoms, and then each chlorine atom has eight electrons, they're happy. Magnesium has no electrons, which really means its previous shell is full, so everybody's happy here but they're not sharing electrons, they're just held together because of the opposite charge. And that's a big difference from covalent compounds, which previously we have called molecular compounds, same thing, covalent, molecular, same thing, where they're sharing electrons, and this is usually how we see Lewis dot symbols. I think introducing Lewis dot symbols with ionic compounds is a good way to get you to understand the idea, but it's not actually how we use them, typically. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about hydrogen atoms, and I mentioned this previously, that they want to form a duet. Now, when you're making a duet, okay, each hydrogen has one electron, and then when they share these electrons, then each one has two electrons, and the 1s orbital is completely full, and hydrogen is happy. This is why hydrogen gas comes as a diatomic gas, because these molecules are so they're just so much happier than individual hydrogen atoms. Now when hydrogen's bonding to other things, we say that hydrogen's a terminal atom, meaning that if you have some molecule, hydrogen's always going to be on the outside 
you're never going to have some bonds, hydrogen, some other bonds, because then hydrogen has too many electrons assigned to it. So that's what we mean by that's what we mean by terminal. Okay, so an example here, let's talk about water. So if you put out the Lewis dot structures for water, you have the hydrogen, the oxygen, the other hydrogen. Oxygen has six valence electrons. Hydrogen each has one. Well, you can see pretty quickly what's going to happen here. The hydrogens are going to come close to the oxygen and they'll share these electrons. So the oxygen and the hydrogen on the left share one pair of electrons. The oxygen and the hydrogen on the right share one pair of electrons. And then the oxygen has two lone pair electrons on it. So if it helps you remember, each line represents two electrons. Now in this structure, the oxygen has a full octet, eight electrons. Each hydrogen has two electrons, so everybody's happy. Now remember, when we're doing this, we're double counting these electrons in between the atoms, right? So the oxygen counted these electrons, the hydrogen counts these electrons also, and that's okay, they're sharing them, so you can double count them, no prob. And again, these are single covalent bonds represented by these lines. Now let's talk about oxygen. So each oxygen has six valence electrons, and let's make O2. Alright, so doing what we've done before, if we make a single covalent bond, well, you don't make octets for all of them. Each one has only seven electrons, and that's not what this wants to do. So instead, in this theory, oxygen will make a double bond. So it will share two pairs of electrons, and in doing so, each oxygen now has eight electrons in the structure, and it has its octet. Both of them have their octets. So multiple bonds are a very common thing that you see. And so here's another example of a double bond. You have carbon dioxide, where each oxygen is sharing two pairs of electrons with the carbon. And if you look at this, the oxygen on the left has eight electrons, the oxygen on the right has eight electrons, and the carbon in the middle has eight electrons. And the carbon has no lone pairs because all eight electrons are bonding to the oxygen in some way. And these are called double bonds. Later in chapter 9, we get into what's actually going on in the double bond, but for now just assume there's two pairs of electrons shared, which is true. Um, how they're shared has some nuances to it, but we don't need to get into that yet. Okay, you can also have a triple bond, so nitrogen exists naturally as a diatomic molecule, because when it does so, it can form this triple bond. In forming the triple bond, the nitrogen on the left has eight electrons, the nitrogen on the right has eight electrons, and so you make this triple bond in the middle. Now, there is no such thing as a quadruple bond. You can only have a single, a double, or a triple bond. No more. And the bond lengths, and also the bond strengths, um, depend on whether you have a triple, double, or single bond. So the triple bonds are shortest, since there's so much negative electron density in between the atoms, when you have a triple bond, there's six electrons in between these two atoms, this is the hardest to break. So therefore it's the strongest bond, because it's holding these nuclei together very strongly with all the negative electrons in between them. Okay, a double bond is a little longer, because it's a little less strong. It doesn't hold the nuclei together as tightly, so therefore they're not as pinned together and the length's a little longer. Now a single bond is even longer. It's also the weakest of the three because there's less negative electrons in between the two nuclei so they're not held together as tightly, as strongly, which means that the atoms are farther apart. And now between types of single bonds there's different strengths depending on the atoms involved and we'll get into that later. But just for now know that triple bond is the strongest and the shortest single bond is the longest and the weakest. So, as I'm sure you've gathered by now, there's a process for doing this. And before we talk about the process in the steps you have to follow, there's a little more content we need to introduce first. And that is formal charges. So let's define this. 
In atoms formal charge, it's the difference between the number of valence electrons in an isolated atom and the number of electrons assigned to that atom in a Lewis structure. So that sentence is a little dense. This little equation might be helpful. So the formal charge, which is what we're trying to find, is the total number of valence electrons in the free atom minus whatever is assigned to it in the Lewis structure. Now how do you determine how many electrons are assigned to it in the Lewis structure? Well you take the total number of lone pairs and then you also take half the shared electrons. We'll have examples of this in a minute but ultimately you take the lone pair electrons and then half the electrons in every bond when you're counting for formal charges. When you counted for octets you talk about I and mean, then you include both the electrons in each bond. But when you do formal charges, you just count one of the electrons in each bond. And so this is phrased this way. Total number of shared electrons is all the ones in the bond, and then you take half of it. Okay, so another thing is the sum of the formal charges of all the atoms in the molecule, or ion, must equal the, to the overall charge on the molecule, or ion. So if you have a neutral molecule, all the charges need to add to zero, all the formal charges do. If you have an ion, like we have cyanide as an example, Cn with an overall minus one charge, then the formal charges across those two atoms need to add to negative one. So here's the way I think about this. The formal charge is the number of electrons an atom brings to the party minus the number of electrons it has once it's there. So say fluorine, it's bringing seven electrons to the party, because that's how many valence electrons it has, and then you subtract from that the number of electrons it has in the Lewis structure once it's there, which in this case is seven. So here the formal charge would be seven minus seven, and that equals zero. It doesn't always equal zero, but you know in this case it does. So that's formal charges. Now why are formal charges important? And the answer there is because they allow you to determine which structure, which arrangement of atoms is the best, and they also tell you about charge on the overall molecule. So for neutral molecules, the Lewis structure with no formal charges anywhere is preferable to a structure where there are formal charges. So if you have two options for ways to arrange atoms, like down on the bottom of the screen, we have two different options for formaldehyde. And, well, we can figure out what the formal charges are once we do the Lewis structures, and the one with no formal charges is going to be preferable. Now, if both of these structures have formal charges, then the one with overall smaller formal charges is better. And point number three here, if you have two different Lewis structures that each have, for example, a plus one and a minus one formal charge, the preferred structure is going to be the one that places the negative formal charge on the most electronegative atom. You don't know what electronegativity is yet, at least in this course, and that'll come very soon. So just hang on to that for a second, and then once you learn what electronegativity is, then this will make more sense. All right, so let's look at formaldehyde here. So here are two possible options, and this is the fully drawn Lewis structure for each one. Both of these has an octet, or sorry, all of the atoms in both of these structures have an octet or a duet, and they're ready to go. So let's count formal charges. Okay, starting on the top, the carbon, it has four valence electrons normally. It brings four electrons to the party. Then you subtract from that however many electrons it has once it's there. And the way you can count that is you count the lone pair electrons, two, and then you count half of the bonding electrons. There's six electrons total that are in these three bonds, so you divide that by half, and then you get three. So you have four minus two minus three, and that gives you negative one. So this carbon has a negative one formal charge. Before we look at the oxygen, let me point this out, that usually if a atom in the Lewis structure has a non-zero formal charge, then you will write that formal charge over the top of the atom in the structure, just to denote that it's there. That's something you have to do if it has a non-zero formal charge. Okay, let's continue with the oxygen. So on oxygen, it has six valence electrons, and then in this structure it has two lone pairs, 
or sorry, two electrons in a lone pair, and then it has six shared electrons in these three bonds, so you divide that by half, and then here the oxygen has a plus one. So this structure overall has formal charges on both the carbon and the oxygen. We didn't show the math for the hydrogen, but if you did it on hydrogen, you'd find that there were no formal charges on hydrogen. Great. Now let's look at the one below. So here the carbon, well it still comes with four valence electrons, because that's what carbon does. And then there's no lone pairs on this carbon, but there's eight electrons contained within these four bonds. So half of eight is four, zero. So in the middle structure here, or on the bottom I guess, it brings four electrons to the party and carbon has four electrons once it's there, it's happy, zero formal charge. Now the slide will put a zero up here. You don't have to write the zero if you don't want to, but sometimes it's helpful to keep track of things. Okay, so the oxygen, it still has six valence electrons, and then here there's four electrons total in lone pairs, and then there's four electrons total in these two bonds. So you take four and then you subtract the half of the bonds, and you get six minus four minus two equals zero. Great. So this oxygen has zero formal charges. Now before we continue to answer our ultimate question, let me point out that this formula on the bottom of the screen will not be given on your exam info sheet. This is one that I want you to know how to use without having it written. Do it enough, practice it enough, and you'll internalize what this means and you'll be able to do it fairly quickly without resorting to a formula. And that's what I want you to do. Okay, back to our eventual question. Which is the most likely Lewis structure for formaldehyde? Well, the structure on the right that's circled, there's zero formal charges. That's preferred. The electrons are distributed in a way that doesn't give any formal charges to the um, atoms, and then that's better. That's preferred. So I'm going to highlight this again because it's easy to get tripped up on, that when you're determining octets of an atom, you count both electrons and any bonds to that atom. But then when you're determining formal charges, you only count one electron from every bond. But you do count both electrons from a lone pair. So keep that in mind, that's very easy to mix up, but very important. Also keep in mind that holy cow, I'm going crazy with the arrows. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Alright, enough. So, now we can get to our outline of how to write Lewis structures. So here's the suggested plan of attack. One, write the skeletal structure. This is, I mean, not a term you need to know, skeletal structure, but basically it means drop the atoms on the page. Now some hints here is that hydrogens are always terminal. Oops, too crazy with the arrow. Um, halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, are often terminal on the outside. You can have bromine and chlorine on the inside. It's a little less common, so generally they go on the outside. Um, usually the more electronegative atoms are on the outside, and the less electronegative atoms are on the inside. You don't know what electronegativity is again, so, you know, hang on to that for now. They're also often symmetric. The unique atom is in the center. If you have NF3, usually the nitrogen's in the middle, just because it makes it symmetric that way. Not always, but usually. Okay, so you put the atoms down on the page, then you add up all the valence electrons, including charges. So if you have a molecule that has an overall negative charge, you need to add an extra electron to your count. If you have a molecule with an overall positive charge, you take away an electron from your overall count. And so I find it easiest to just sum them all together. Here's the total number of valence electrons. Okay, so you have the atoms written on the page, you know the number of electrons. Now you can make bonds between them, because you know that at minimum there needs to be a single bond there. And there's two electrons in each bond. Then, if you have extra electrons, then add them to the structure. It's easiest to start on the outside and work your way in.
All right, so if you need to, you can make double or triple bonds by moving electrons from a lone pair into this bond. And often you have to do this in order to satisfy the octet rule. Now, you need to minimize formal charges. So if there's some way to redistribute electrons so that your overall formal charges are lower, you have to do that. Or formal charges can inform which of your possible choices for skeletal structure were correct. Then, finally, please check your work. I see a lot of people on tests write down incorrect answers that if they had just stopped and recounted the electrons, they would see that their structure is not viable. So, count your total number of electrons in your structure. Make sure you didn't lose or gain any. It's actually kind of easy to do. Double check that you satisfy the octet rule for everything that should have its octet satisfied. And then, I'm putting this in here now, but we haven't talked about what resonance is, and we'll get to that in a subsequent video. But if you can make resonance structures, you have to do that. So we'll talk about that later. Okay, this is going to require practice. It's a plan, it's a symbolic formula type thing. You need to get comfortable in working with it. Okay, I have a sheet that gives the steps to writing Lewis structures that I'm going to post on Moodle, and you can print that off and see it if you would like. Alright, so say you were given this problem. What's the Lewis structure of nitrogen trifluoride? Well, let's go through our steps. So step one, make the skeletal structure. So nitrogen, it's the unique atom. Let's start with it in the center. Halogens are also usually on the outside. They're usually terminal, and especially fluorine, it's always on the outside. So, okay, so down at the bottom here, I put the skeletal structure. Nitrogen in the middle, fluorine on the sides. I made this T-shaped just because I felt like it. We haven't talked about geometry yet, but usually you would draw this to indicate a certain geometry, but that's chapter 8 and we're not there yet. Okay, now we sum the valence electrons together. Nitrogen has 5, fluorine has 7, there's 3 fluorines. So you do this, you get 26 total valence electrons. Alright, you know there needs to be bonds between the nitrogen and the fluorine, so let's put the bonds in. That was two, four, six electrons from our three bonds, so we have 20 electrons still to go. So you basically just drop these in your structure, starting on the outside and working your way in. So, but don't put more than an octet worth of electrons onto the fluorine. Since each fluorine is bound to the nitrogen, there's two electrons there, so then you put six electrons on each fluorine. And once you do that, that gets you to 24 electrons, and then you put two electrons on the nitrogen. Great. Now we got to see if this works. So check for octets. So the nitrogen has an octet, 2, 4, 6 from the bonds, and then 2 from the lone pair makes 8. Each fluorine has 2, 4, 6 from lone pairs, and then 2 from the bond, which makes 8. And all the fluorines are the same, so each fluorine has an octet. So that's great. So we're getting close to being done. Now, it's a good exercise to check formal charges. For this molecule, it turns out that it doesn't really tell you anything. So when I first wrote this slide, I didn't have step 5 in here, I just skipped it. But I want to put it in here to point out that sometimes that's useful. And so, if you check the formal charges on this molecule, um, you'll see that none of these have a formal charge. That's good, so then we can continue on. Now step six, the double check, right? Are the total number of electrons in the structure equal to 26? Well, there's two, four, six from the bonds, and then if you count the rest of them, you'll see that we get up to 26. So, great, so we're done. We have the Lewis structure of nitrogen trifluoride. Life is good. Another example. Let's write the Lewis structure of cyanide. So I have all the steps written out here. So when you do this, you have a pretty straightforward arrangement. There's only one way you can do this. The carbon, oop, that's not a drawing tool. The carbon and the nitrogen are next to each other. That's easy. Now you count the valence electrons and you get nine valence electrons and then this thing has an overall negative one charge so that gives you ten valence electrons total. Usually, in fact almost always, your number of valence electrons is even. There are cases where you have odd number of electrons, and we'll talk about that near the end of the chapter.
but generally it's an even number. So that's good, there's 10. Because if you need to make pairs of electrons, you need even numbers of electrons total. All right, so carbon, nitrogen, there's a bond. That's two electrons. Now I'm just going to start adding. Four, I don't know, six, eight, ten, sure. So we can add our electrons. And then step four, let's check for octets and see how this went. So if I look at the carbon over here, it's got two, four, six electrons. That's not an octet. That means I'm going to have to do something else. And the nitrogen is in the same boat, two, four, six electrons total. So we don't have octets. We also don't have any more electrons that we can add. So when you feel like you're short of electrons, you just have to share more electrons and have them count towards more octets. I'll just do this at the same time. I'm just going to say that if we take both of these lone pairs on the carbon and the nitrogen, at least one lone pair from each, and drop them in the middle to make a triple bond, then let's see what that does. So I'm going to erase the carbon, the lone pairs up here, and I'm going to move them into this triple bond. Now let's see what that did. When we count for octets, we have two, four, six, eight for the carbon, great. And the nitrogen is the same thing, two, four, six, eight. Perfect. So step five, look for formal charges. Well, okay, when we look at formal charges, for carbon, it starts with four valence electrons. Now in this structure, we have assigned one, two, and then half of each of these bonds, three, four, five. So four minus five equals negative one. So then we need to write a little negative one on top of the carbon. You'll notice that what I did was not exactly the formula I had written previously. Feel free to use either way that works for you. When I'm doing it, I just count lone pairs, and then I count one from each bond, which is the same thing as counting lone pairs and the total from all the bonds and then dividing in half. So I just do it this way. All right, for the nitrogen, it starts with five valence electrons. And then when we count, it has one, two, three, four, five. Great, so nitrogen has five minus five, so its formal charge is zero. So we could write a zero up here if we wanted to. You don't have to. But you do definitely have to write the negative one. One other thing is that we often will circle the formal charge just to make it look good. So you'll usually see this with a little circle around it. You don't have to, but you can. Sometimes it's helpful so there's not random lines and stuff flying around. You see it circled, you realize, oh, that's a negative one you wrote. Okay. And then do the double check. Do we have 10 electrons total in here? Yes, because we started with 10, we have 10, great. We already checked the octets, we did the formal charge. Cool, so we're done. So here's the Lewis structure for the cyanide ion. One last thing to point out. When you go to Wikipedia and you look up structures of molecules, or when you take organic chemistry, you'll see that we very often will draw Lewis structures like this. Now, if you think about what we just talked about, what the heck is this? There's no atom here. Why do we have just like random lines coming together? And that's a shortcut that just makes life a lot faster and easier to deal with. So you often see that, okay, the lines are still bonds, but for every carbon atom, it's just denoted by the intersection of two lines. So on the left, I have the true Lewis structure, and on the right, I have the bond line drawing, the common version of this. So what this really means is that there's a carbon atom right here. There's a carbon atom right here. There's one here, one here. Uh, what am I missing? There's a carbon atom here. And it's just a faster way to draw the compounds. So just keep that in mind if you go looking for a structure. Um, oh, another thing about this is that usually lone pairs are omitted, and you just have to know that, well, this nitrogen, as it's drawn, it doesn't have an octet, so if I put a lone pair on it, it has an octet. Ultimately, nitrogen always has a lone pair on it, unless it's charged.
And these are just kind of things that you learn and get used to. Anyways, you don't need to know this for this class. It was just something I wanted to point out so that if you go and see structures elsewhere, you can start to understand what it means. Okay, and that's Lewis structures. So this is just the basic intro to Lewis structures, and then we build on this later. So make sure you start from here and you know how to work with this, and then we'll definitely build on it in subsequent videos. Thanks for watching.